Hi folks, this little video is going to be talking about stabilization for your camera and specifically with regards to tripods. So that'll actually make up most of the video. And then just towards the end, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, remote shutter releases, uh, which are things that you often find associated with tripods. So let's get started. So do I need a tripod? Well, like anything, it depends. Uh, and it depends basically on the sort of photography that you're doing. Uh, there are some types of photography for which this can be really helpful. So for instance, if you've got a very heavy full frame camera with those long heavy lenses, like a long telephoto lens, if it's fully extended out there and you've got the subject uh, you know, bouncing in the frame there, trying to keep that nice and steady can be really hard. The tripod's very useful for that. Um, to improve the overall sharpness in your photos really makes a difference if you've uh, got a tripod, particularly if you're a little shaky on it. Um, it's helpful in low light situations. For example, if you're taking sunrise and sunset landscape shots and uh, you're, you're dealing with limited amount of light anyway, so you might have the shutter open for longer, um, then uh, the um, tripod's really going to help for that. And particularly for astrophotography, which I do a bit of as well, where you might have the shutter open for you know 20 or 30 seconds. Uh, you must keep that camera really, really steady and a tripod helps for that. Uh, if you want to try and get the ISO low enough for better image quality so there's less noise, very helpful for that. Doing self-portraits with, with a timer, if you want to get involved in the actual photo, uh, setting that up, setting the camera up on the tripod and racing around into the shot really helps with that. And macro work, I do quite a lot of macro work and because you're dealing with macro lenses where the um, depth of field is actually quite narrow, uh, any uh, movement either forwards or backwards will show up in terms of where the actual center of focus is. So keeping that camera set up and steady while you take your shot really helps for that. There's an example of it there. You can't see the tripod very well, but you can see the camera is focusing on a tiny little uh, electronic board, a little power supply board there. And uh, that actually came up really well because I was able to get it nice and steady on the tripod. Uh, shooting at different ang difficult angles, sometimes it's actually easier to set it up and concentrate on just making the shot if it's a really difficult angle. Uh, slow shutter work, uh, those long exposure type of images where you know you've got those silky waterfalls and a, uh, uh, maybe a coastal scene where you've got the um, you know the waves have been coming in and out but you get that milky sort of smooth look there um, again that really makes a huge difference and if you're into high dynamic range photography where you're taking um, uh, multiple exposures uh, and then blending them together um, back home uh, high dynamic range images with multiple exposures really need to be set up the same Im image at different exposures needs to be really set up very nicely for that and the tripod helps with that as it does with panoramas as you're um, panning across the uh, the landscape there there are however some disadvantages to tripods some are heavy to carry and that can be a problem particularly if you're um, rummaging around in the in the bush uh, or walking long distances through the city and things like that um, so that that can be a, an issue it's another thing to carry you might have a backpack you've got your camera you might have the uh, an additional lens you've got your water bottle and you've got the tripod as well uh, it can be tricky setting up a tripod in busy environments. So if you're talking about, uh, you know, you're going to a, a busy tourist attraction and uh, sure, as, sure as anything, somebody's going to come along and trip over one of the legs of the tripod. Um, the other thing is that they can't be set up very quickly. So, uh, you know, if you suddenly see a shot, you can't sort of uh, whip out the tripod easily and, and set it up and take the shot straight away. Um, that's really where you've got the advantage of just been holding the camera and shooting it. And then if you don't set the tripod up correctly, it could, could fall. Uh, and then of course you've got some big expenses fixing up the uh, camera after that. Good tripods are expensive, so that's another disadvantage. Um, but on the other hand, if you buy a, a good tripod, it should last for decades. 
Okay, what are the important parts of a tripod that you need to consider? Well, there's four parts. Firstly, there's the legs, obviously, and they're made, they can be made of a variety of different uh, um, materials. Uh, the basalt one is like a volcanic rock, and so that's actually uh, blended into a fibre. And the Gitzo company uh, are well known for making basalt tripods. Uh, the carbon fibre ones are, are very good too and uh, they are a little bit more expensive but they're actually coming down in price uh, of uh, recent times which is, which is good to see. Uh, feet uh, on the tripod. Uh, some feet uh, allow for um, changes uh, depending on whether you're indoors or outdoors. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The centre post. Uh, many tripods have a centre post, uh, which is allows you to raise the uh, tripod, the head of the tripod, even higher. And there, is, in fact, is one of my tripods, which has um, been turned upside down. I've actually taken the centre post out and turned it upside down, uh, and then put it back into the uh, tripod there to take that shot of a, a of a tiny lace wing insect which is on the window, sitting on the window there. It was easier for me to set that up than try and get down on, on the ground myself to take it. Of course, the other thing to consider are the heads of the tripods. Uh, there are many different types of heads. The two most common ones are the ball head and the pan tilt, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Things to consider when buying a tripod. What weight can it support? Um, most tripods, the good ones, are rated to uh, carry a particular weight. Uh, so you need to consider the weight of the uh, your heaviest camera and its heaviest and longest lens. And the tripod should support at least 1.5 times the size or the weight of your, your the gear. So at least 1.5 times the weight of your gear. Could even be up to two, two times if you want to be really safe with it. What height can the tripod go without you, uh, using the centre post? Uh, now, I was not aware of this when I first started buying tripods that they they are actually there is can be a difference in the height um, of your your normal average tripod there. So, if you're a taller person, you might want to make sure that you get um, you know a tall enough tripod without having to use that uh, centre post. Uh, Tripods weight in construction, we have talked about that already. Um, a lightweight is obviously better for traveling and uh, a studio tripod can be used which can be heavier and I've got two tripods. I've got a, a, a really nice Manfrotto tripod which is the first one I bought and uh, that, that works really well but I tend to leave it home these days because it's uh, um, a fair bit heavier than a lightweight tripod. Only by about... Um, uh, 1.2, 1.3 kilograms, but if you're carrying around the tripod all day long, that 1.3 kilograms starts to get, you really start to notice it. Some other things to consider, tripod legs can come in three, four or five sections to each leg. In fact, I have seen tripods that have had six sections to a leg. Um, try to go for ones that are three and four sections rather than five or six, uh, mainly because there is a chance that with some tripods, the more sections there are, the ch more chance there is of instability there. Uh, the locking mechanism will generally tend to be either a twist lock or a flip lock. And in the two tripods I've got, um, one's a twist and one's a flip. Uh, and I use both equally equally well. The twist took a little bit more time to actually get used to, um, but uh, I'm now just as fast with the twist as I am with the flip, and I don't mind either. Legs can be set at different angles. Um, on, on the really cheap tripods, that's difficult. They tend not to be like that, but on the good tripods, you should be able to set each leg independently at different angles to each other, which can be handy in, say, a situation like this, where you've got a tripod um, with two of the legs sitting on the on the wall and the third leg um, extending out to the ground. Uh, and that's a really good way of uh, if you if you've got to set a tripod up in a in a in an uneven ground situation uh, or on different angles, that can be really helpful. 
uh, changeable feet. Let's talk about that um, because uh, when you're on different surfaces, the requirements are a little different. So if you have a look at this diagram here, you'll see that there is um, a spike at the, uh, the photo at the top there, uh, which is really good for uneven or unstable ground. You can wind it right out so that the leg is resting on the rubber part of that, that stopper there, um, which means that it's going to grip better. Now, if you're on uh, timber floors or parquetry floors, you want to be careful you're not using the spike because you don't want to be obviously marking the floor. A lot of tripods come with a spirit level, um, which is just a, a level there to make sure that you're um, actually horizontal and, and so on. So that can be really helpful as well. Uh, the tripod head, which we've already mentioned, the pan tilt head, tends to be a single or dual handle mechanism for vertical and horizontal movement and a lot of tripods will tend to be um, the pan tilt head type. Uh, then uh, the ball head is also out there as well and the way this is where you have one control that loosens and tightens the grip and it can be really flexible so you can really set it up whichever way you like in whatever direction. So um, they're really um, uh, quite useful and sometimes they can be a little bit too flexible. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to try and move it, it can be a little bit hard to control until you get used to it. Then there is another one called a gimbal head which is used for um, uh, larger and heavier gear. Um, videographers use gimbal heads quite often because their gear is, is quite uh, heavy. And uh, for uh, certain types of photography, such as bird photography, again, you have got that opportunity where um, with the gimbal head, uh, you can actually keep it flexible but balanced and sitting on top of, uh, at any particular angle you want, on top of the... Uh, the uh, tripod so uh, it's a more of a specialist sort of thing it's a little bit more complicated it's a little bigger um, and it's probably something that you really need to consider um, if you're doing specialist type of um, photographic or video work but for most for most people the pan tilt uh, or ball head um, is uh, is what they tend to go to and again with my two tripods one's a pan tilt and one's a ball head and uh, and I really do enjoy probably using the ball head but again it's personal preference uh, there is a, um, a picture there of the ball head on the left and you can see that there is just that one uh, locking mechanism and the pan, pan tilt with the uh, the dual mechanisms there all right, and then there's um, quite often a variety of uh, quick release systems. That's releasing the camera from the tripod. Uh, so there's usually a, a plate that's put um, that's um, screwed to the camera, and it's that plate that is um, uh, released from the tripod. And so again, it's worth trying uh, a variety of quick release uh, systems to see which one you prefer. Now, when we're talking about tripods, you can't really ca go past talking about other types of stabilisation as well. So, for instance, monopods, which are basically just a one-leg job, and these are really good for when you need to go out and about, such as, is, as in this example here. So they're very good. You see sports photographers using these quite a lot. Again, um, wildlife photographers can use these as well. And they are, for some people, easier to transport and move around uh, than having a tripod. And you, can, and you can get them set up a little bit quicker. Another one is called the Gorilla Pod, which is a tripod with flexible legs, and you can just bend it any way you like. It's really good when you're traveling around, uh, trips to the city, uh, where you don't want to be carrying a big tripod, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, but they are really for much smaller cameras. Uh, um, smaller cameras and, and smartphone cameras um, are really are quite good on these things. You wouldn't put a full frame camera with a long lens on this, it just wouldn't wouldn't hold it up. And if you look at the um, photograph on the right there, you can bend the legs around so you can attach them to rails. Um, if you're out in the bush, you can um, attach them to uh, branches and things like that. So they, they're quite useful for that sort of thing. But again, not everybody would necessarily look at that, um, but they are out there and a lot of people use them. 
And then there is a thing called a platypod. And this is one of those things that I want. I haven't bought one yet. I've been looking at it for a few years now. And I think these are great. They're actually a plate uh, and with a, uh, a head attached to it, which allows you to get down really nice and low. And you can take some fantastic photos with, uh, with one of those. So that's a platypod. Of course, there are other types of um, stabilisation as well that we shouldn't forget about. You don't necessarily have to have a tripod. Stabilisation is keeping the camera steady. And so you can use your backpack, you could use a camera bag, um, a sandbag. Obviously, you're not going to be carrying a sandbag around in the, in the bush with you, but if you're at home, a sandbag is, the, is that sort of thing. A book, you could use the side of a wall, you could use a tree, you could lean it up against something, you can lean it on a fence. All of those things are stabilisation, just as, as, uh, as a tripod is. So, summarising here, it really is a case of um, working out how often you're going to use a tripod. And then you have to decide how much you want to spend. You can buy cheap tripods, um, very cheap tripods, and they will not last. That's a fact. Uh, so if you're going to buy one and you think you're going to use one over the long term, then once you've bought one, as I said earlier, it'll last for, uh, for decades. So let's go now to remote shutter releases. And this is firing the shutter remotely. This is all about not having to press down the um, shutter button. So the reason why you find these with tripods is that it's usually for fairly critical sort of work. So what is a remote shutter release? Well, if you have a look at the first photo, the photo on the left there, you'll see that there's a cable release there. So that's, a, that's a, a cable of a short length there. It plugs into the camera and you can move away from the tripod or from wherever the camera is and uh, set your photo up with that. The two on the right are, um, is actually a receiver and a transmitter. So these are wireless um, releases uh, and they work on an infrared um, principle. Uh, the receiver attaches to your camera and the transmitter is in your hand. And so you can walk around all over the place and, and fire the, um, uh, the shutter whenever you like. Uh, these infrared devices can work up to as much as 100 metres. So uh, you can actually move around quite well with one of those. If your camera has a Wi-Fi facility, uh, then um, a smartphone app um, is often made available for some of these cameras. Well, what would I use it for? Well, as I mentioned earlier, to prevent shake when pressing down the camera's shutter, um, particularly useful, uh, as we said earlier, with uh, long telephoto lens uh, for macro work, uh, shooting in low night, uh, multiple exposures such as HDR and so on, to uh, shoot exposures longer than 30 seconds. So for instance, if you're doing light painting or uh, astro night photography where the shutter is open for a long period of time, then again, and you don't want to be pressing down that shutter and causing any movement. Here's an example of um, uh, <laughs> sort of auto light painting i guess with headlights and tail lights from cars and this was taken by a photographer who had it on a tripod and used a shutter release as well and it was because it was much longer than a 30 second shot and as we've already mentioned um, a shutter release allows you to stand away from the camera to be in the shot uh, and to also um, uh, help with placing the cameras at different angles where well, you don't need to get to the the actual uh, shutter button itself um, You can fire it off remotely Now some remotes are pretty fancy. They'll have lightning triggers and intervalometers and uh, sound and movement triggers the sound and movement ones are the ones that are often used by people who are um, uh, Researching wildlife and so on and they'll put them on the cameras at night uh, and uh, when a little critter comes along, they'll, uh, it'll, it'll um, trigger the, uh, the camera to uh, open the shutter. Um, and some remotes are so fancy that they'll actually control the camera functions, a number of camera functions, from the actual remote itself. 
and they come with a variety of other features. Now those sorts of remotes are pretty expensive, they're pretty specialised and you may not necessarily want to buy one of those. And again, do I need one? Well, <laughs> it depends again on the sort of photography that, uh, that you're doing. Firstly, it's worth checking what facilities your camera already offers. For instance, self-timers are very useful. Now on my Nikon camera, it has two, five and 10 seconds um, uh, on their self-timers. So um, if I uh, don't want to be bothered setting up the, uh, the remote shutter system, uh, or I haven't got it with me, I can use the self-timer and then I can um, you know, press the shutter wait two seconds and then it fires the shot set the shutter wait 10 seconds scramble around to where i want to be in the picture and uh, and then it takes the shot some cameras have a um, uh, a time shutter speed instead of a bulb mode so the bulb mode comes into action uh, if it's going over 30 seconds but some cameras these days are now uh, punch in say a one minute 20 seconds and it'll fire for that length of time. Cameras with Wi-Fi can be used with smartphone apps, so we talked about that. So um, again, check your camera. Uh, not all cameras have it, the older ones won't, but the newer ones certainly will. So some of those facilities may mean that you don't necessarily have to buy a, a remote shutter release. You've already got what, um, uh, facilities that you can use in your camera to help you with that. Uh, so you, as I've mentioned before, have to decide whether you will use it for your photography needs. And then once you've done that, it's a case of, well, what do you buy? And, uh, and as always, it depends on how much you want to spend. The cable ones are, 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 can be expensive, but they're usually at the cheaper end of the range. The wireless or infrared ones are, are, tend to be um, probably around about hundred dollars up uh, because you're dealing with the transmitter and the receiver uh, they can get quite fancy you can get up to four and five hundred dollars with those um, but again it depends on what you want to do you don't have to spend that much I certainly didn't spend four or five hundred dollars uh, and of course the smartphone apps are, are available uh, at the App Store but you need to make sure that the remote is going to work with your camera remotes are camera specific so when you buy a remote, you're buying one for your particular camera brand and model. Okay. So for instance, my Nikon, that's the receiver, that's the uh, transmitter there. Um, they uh, will work on my Nikon D800. Now these will work on with lots of other Nikon cameras as well. Uh, uh, but you need to check to see that your model is in there as well. And... Uh, with that, the, this wireless version here, you need to also make sure that it comes with a cable attachment or you have to buy it. Now, occasionally the cable attachment will be included in the package um, for your particular camera, uh, but quite often it's not. So you actually buy the, the cable attachment as, as a specific thing. So the, the, the uh, plug on the end of this is specific to your um, camera. That's the reason why you have to um, look at remotes for your camera. It's related to as much to the, uh, the uh, cable as anything else. So that's about it from me and I hope that's been of some help and uh, good luck with your photography and good luck uh, with um, finding a good tripod. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again soon.